It is my privilege on behalf of the Nixon family to welcome all of you here. This is both a time for tears, but it's also a time for smiles and happiness in our hearts because this is a Christian service and we believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and we believe that we too are going to rise in that day that is yet to come. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. We shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and shall be changed. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God who giveth us the victory in Jesus Christ our Lord. You may be seated. I have this honor today because in 1958, President Eisenhower sent the Vice President and Mrs. Nixon on a goodwill trip to Africa. And Admiral Radford, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, convinced the Vice President to add two military aides to his small staff on a temporary trial basis. I was a junior officer and served as a ceremonial aide for Pat Nixon. I was inexperienced as an aide and I did not know the Nixons so I was a little more scared than usual. In fact, on the first few ceremonial occasions, it was hard to tell the aide from the AD. But she was a teacher, and I soon learned a little about protocol and a lot about Pat Nixon. The African heat, the primitive accommodations, and the grueling schedules tested everyone's endurance. And the unstructured third world protocol made for some challenging ad hocing at various ceremonies. But I was amazed by her limitless stamina and her patience, her knack for looking fresh in 110 degree temperatures, and her ability to relate convincingly to people, especially the children. Clearly, she was a superb ambassador. 
In Washington, the temporary trial period lasted four years, and I got to know her better and learn more about her. I learned that the steel in her character was forged by the hardships of her early life. At 13, she lost her mother to cancer, and five years later, nursed her father through his final illness. She maintained a home for her two brothers, and she worked her way through USC, graduating cum laude. After her marriage, she taught high school and worked as an OPA wartime economist. In 1946, she became a member of the Pat, Dick and Pat political team and embarked on the most important and demanding work of her life. Now, I marveled as she functioned as a homemaker and devoted mother while coping with the official and social obliga obligations of Washington. One Christmas, the Nixons hosted at home five separate parties to accommodate the guest list of officials, diplomats, and friends. But the Nixon family still had a, tra had a traditional Christmas. Now, by now, we were friends, and I thought I knew her well. But on the 1958 Goodwill trip, to South America, our last stop was Caracas. Now, I knew she was tough, but Caracas convinced me that her courage knew no bounds. The rioting mob that welcomed us had been whipped into a frenzy by their student leaders. These students were in their middle age. Our past brushes with demonstrators and even my combat tour in Korea had not prepared me for the hate and the unrelenting fury that was unleashed on us. It was humiliating infuriating and terrifying. With the foreign minister's wife, Pat moved slowly and calmly towards the cars while the crowd roared insults and the spit rained down. During the motorcade, she comforted the foreign minister's wife who was close to hysterics. We talked quietly, but I can't remember anything we said except that she asked frequently if the vice president was all right. I reassured her as best I could with cross fingers. Throughout the ride, I never saw her flinch when the car was hit with various missiles and clubs. She remained totally um, composed, and that made it easier for me and for the Secret Service. Upon reaching the embassy residence, she quickly freshened up and began to talk with the Vice President about our situation. Her principal concern was to get word to Tricia and Julie that they were all right. Now we left Caracas the next day through a tear gas mist with an overabundance of military protection that was noticeably absent the day before. But we left in a Nixon style with heads up and all flags flying. In later years, she did not lose her touch. She was at home visiting leper colonies or riding in an open door helicopter to visit the combat troops in Vietnam. And her courage was her trademark as she stood by her husband in good times and in bad. In closing, I can think of no better tribute than part of a quote from reporter Bob Hartman's Caracas story. Pat Nixon was magnificent. To know Pat Nixon was to know a woman of compassion, courage, and character, who had an unusual ability to relate to people. I first met Nix Mrs. Nixon in 1969 in the White House. My father had just been appointed Secretary of Agriculture, and I was a young law student, newly married, and of the same age group as the Nixon's daughters, Tricia and Julie. Before that introduction, I knew Mrs. Nixon in her public role as an ambassador of goodwill. I, along with the entire American public, admired her graciousness and we were proud that she would represent us as First Lady. But until that first meeting, I had not realized what a warm and natural person she was. She put people immediately at ease. One felt one was visiting with a good friend with whom one could share concerns and problems and that she would understand and she would care. She was a woman of substance. She was current always and interested in world and national events. When I was visiting the Nixons during the Gulf War, I referred one day to an editorial in that morning's Wall Street Journal. And Mrs. Nixon asked me which editorial because she said that morning there were two editorials in the journal about the Gulf War. She was right. 
Over the past 25 years, through my friendship with Tricia and Julie, I've come to know and admire Mrs. Nixon and her roles as mother, grandmother, wife, and friend. She created around her in every Nixon home an atmosphere of love and beauty, and she did that in the White House too. She loved flowers, and she surrounded each home with gardens in such a way that one could look out of the window and enjoy the colors of the flowers and the foliage as an extension of the beauty in each room. And she dressed in the same fresh, soothing colors with which she decorated. She had an eye for style and beauty. The Secret Service's code name for Mrs. Nixon was Starlight. That's an appropriate reflection of the light and beauty that were so much a part of her. I admired Mrs. Nixon especially as a, as a mother and as a grandmother. Any of you who know the Dick Nixon daughters and admire the fine ladies that they are, women of kindness and grace, can appreciate Mrs. D no, Mrs. Nixon's devotion to her family. The girls grew up knowing that they were the most important priority in both of their parents' busy lives. The love, devotion, respect, pride, and loyalty that each member of the family has for the other is beautiful. As a grandmother, Mrs. Nixon had a special relationship with each grandchild, which she tailored to their unique personalities. I enjoyed watching her spend seemingly endless hours play imaginary games with her granddaughters Jenny and Melanie Eisenhower when they were small. Jenny used to love to play shoe store clerk, and Mrs. Nixon was incredibly pl patient playing her role as customer, even allowing Jenny to dump every shoe out of the closet and then try on pair after pair for Jenny. Melanie enjoyed playing waitress, and one evening when I was visiting, she not only took the dinner orders, but she served the dinner with both grandparents playing their roles as appreciative restaurant patrons. Grandson Christopher Cox spent countless hours with his grandmother, and he shared her love of the outdoors and of dogs. And Alex Eisenhower had an enthusiastic grandmother rooting for him at many of his baseball games. They and we enjoyed Mrs. Nixon's youthful spirit. She was fun to be with. She had a great spirit of adventure. It was that sense of adventure that led her to become half of the Dick and Pat partnership that began in California 53 years ago and brought them to heights of fame, power, turmoil, frustration, and peace that few have experienced. The Bible in Proverbs 31 describes a woman of noble character, a woman such as Pat Nixon. She is clothed in strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, and her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all.
I'll never forget the day that I caught, literally caught, Pat Nixon. Back then, I knew her as Mrs. Nixon, but of course, Pat was the name by which we would all come to know and love her, and now it, it seems strange to call her anything else. I first met her during Dick Nixon's 1962 campaign for governor. As Mrs. Nixon campaigned, thousands, literally thousands of people lined up for blocks in city after city just to shake her hand. In fact, the campaign strategist quickly learned that Pat Nixon was a far bigger draw than the incumbent governor that they were running against. By the end of the campaign, Pat was doing three events a day on her own and joining her husband every evening for one more rally. Fresh out of law school, I was an advanced man setting up some of those rallies. One night, we staged a rally in at Los Angeles State. Pat campaigned with her usual grace, her tireless good humor. She was recovering from a mild illness, but you'd never have known it, not from the energy and the enthusiasm that she communicated to the audience. It was clear from their smiles and the close attention that the crowd was captivated, feeling the same warmth and good cheer that Pat Nixon seemed to inspire in everyone she met. And this was one of the first events that I had advanced for Mrs. Nixon. As we were making our way off campus after the rally, we were forced to negotiate some steps, some concrete steps. And as she started down those steps, her heel caught on the top step, she lost her footing and pitched forward. Well, I was just ahead and below her on the steps. I turned around just in time to see her falling. My heart was in my mouth. I reached out with both arms and grabbed her around the waist. As I helped her back to her feet, she made a slight joke about familiarity on short notice. She lost her footing, never her composure, never her good humor, and made life much easier for a young advanced man in his late 20s who a moment before had seen his career even as a volunteer advanced man disappearing. Well, I noticed as I held her literally in my arms what a slight woman she was. And I've never forgotten it because it struck me as such a paradox that such a strong personality and such a vigorous spirit could be contained in so delicate a frame. And that contrast, I think, was always there. She was the tireless campaigner, but she brought to politics so much dignity, such warmth, and such generosity of spirit. And in the often harsh adversarial world of politics, generosity of spirit of the kind that she produced is too often a very scarce and precious commodity. People around the world could sense that in her. Pat Nixon projected a genuineness and a kindliness that were real, reflecting her own inner feelings. And if Richard Nixon is the most traveled public figure of all time, Pat Nixon must be a close runner-up. When I met her in 1962, she had already been to all 50 states and more than 50 foreign nations. And everywhere that she went, whether it was a state visit to Singapore or a campaign trip to Sacramento, she practiced her own very personal brand of diplomacy. And as Don Hughes has said, children especially, children everywhere were drawn to her. Their instincts for finding love always uncanny. Whether it was in Africa, or in California, or the children in the Moscow hospital that she visited on the trip that became famous for the kitchen debate in which Nikita Khrushchev learned the hard way that Dick Nixon would not be bullied nor would he allow his country to be intimidated by Khrushchev's crude bullying tactics. Both adults and children instinctively warm to Pat. She radiated dignity, honesty, a quiet strength, 
and a wholesome charm that made her instantly real to, to all, whether they shared the political feelings of her husband. Indeed, I think it explains why Pat Nixon was, and I believe I am right, the only woman in American history to have been America's most admired, among America's most admired women in three different decades. Pat Nixon knew trial as well as triumph. As Don said, her childhood did not last long, and it was not easy. Growing up, as a teenager, she nursed two terminally ill parents, kept up the family's farm with her two young brothers just south of Los Angeles. She worked her way through college with jobs ranging from telephone operator to Hollywood Extra before graduating cum laude from USC. That tough start seemed to have fortified an already strong character. It seemed to prepare her well for the demands that would come later in public life. And her devotion to others never wavered. Her courage never faltered, no matter what the challenge. In good times and bad, she used her strength to protect that which she prized above all else, her family. It was obvious to everyone even the most casual observers, that she loved her family deeply. She nurtured Julie and Tricia with that love, and her love helped shield them from the darker pressures of public life. She was almost visibly protective of the husband whose courage and commitment she so admired and shared. In her fine eyes, Pat's concern and love were plain to see. For him, and for the daughters that she so cherished when mean personal attacks were launched against him. But in that fragile body beat a great Irish fighting heart. As Don has told you, she felt anger far more than fear when that vicious, ugly, anti-American crowd, that mob, beset their vice presidential motorcade in Venezuela. For Pat Nixon, her family, her husband, her children, and her grandchildren were, in the words of the poet Theodore Retke, her last pure stretch of joy. Well, that joy may have sprung from her family, and she gave it back to them tenfold and shared it with many others. I've heard the story of one very special night at the White House. It was a celebration of Duke Ellington's 70th birthday and the Nixons were entertaining a virtual who's who of American jazz. The guests ranged from Cab Calloway to Earl Hines to Richard Rogers. After the evening's performers had played tributes to Ellington, President Nixon asked for one more song from the evening's honoree, the grand old man of American jazz. President Nixon escorted the Duke to the piano. And the room was hushed as Ellington sat there for a moment in silence. Then he said that he would improvise a melody. He said, I shall pick a name, gentle, graceful, something like Patricia. And then the Duke played a lovely, soft melody. As President Nixon recounted it, the melody was, quote, lyrical, delicate, and beautiful just like Pat. Well, the song may be over, but that lyrical and beautiful melody called Patricia lingers on today. The memory of Pat Nixon and all she meant to her family, her country, is a legacy we shall all always cherish. When the doors of this beautiful library and museum were open to the public three years ago, Mr. President, you told a story which I think bears repeating today. You recall a campaign stop you once made in Kansas. My prede predecessor, Senator Frank Carlson, told you with typical Kansas bluntness, Dick, 
You're controversial, but everybody loves Pat. The outpouring of affection and admiration from across America and around the world over the past few days has underscored the truth of these words. Everybody did love Pat Nixon. For her grace, for her grit, for her heart, for her steadfastness to her family, they loved her because they knew she cared. As most people here know, Washington, D.C. is a town where the monuments are tall and the egos are even taller. Every once in a while, however, there comes along a rare spirit like Pat Nixon, who dispels the cynicism and reminds us that compassion need not be legislated, it need only be felt and then expressed by hugging a child, by comforting a victim of a natural disaster, or just personally answering a letter from one of the countless real people who turn to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue when all other avenues are closed. In an age saturated with the false values of celebrity, Pat Nixon was as genuine as those signers she insisted on signing on her letters. She would stand in a receiving line for hours, aware that for her guests, this might be their only White House evening. And as a friend of hers told me this week, Pat treated everyone like a head of state. I'm reminded of the story in Julie's biography of her mother about a poster child who was brought to the White House to meet Mrs. Nixon. The frightened and nervous young boy looked at Pat and declared that this can't be your house because I don't see a washing machine. So the story goes, Pat took him by the hand. They rode an elevator to the third floor. They walked down the carpeted hallway into the laundry rooms where Pat showed him her washing machine. His parents were surprised. Their son had never before gone off with a stranger. But then Pat Nixon never really, was never really a stranger to anyone. She made friends wherever she went, has been indicated, not only in America, but Africa, Asia, Europe, and South America. And time and time again, she set new precedents in diplomacy by disregarding protocol, going to where the people were, and reaching out to those overlooked by conventional, conventional official visitors. Wherever Mrs. Nixon went, as has been indicated before by Don and Governor Wilson. She never forgot where she came from, and we all know how important that is. When she presided over the White House, she was still the same person who nursed her parents through their final illness and who scrubbed floors in a bank so that she might attend college. As First Lady, Pat Nixon was a patron of American culture who never patronized her countrymen. She loved the White House, not for its power, but for its beauty and its history. She restored it with hundreds of original furnishings, and she did it her way, quietly, professionally, with total involvement and minimum publicity. Mr. President, you're fond of Teddy Roosevelt, and especially fond of his reference to the political world as the arena. Those of us privileged to serve in that arena know that we're not there alone. Our family is there, our battle are their battles, our victories, their victories, our defeats, their defeats, our dreams, their dreams. And there are times when the arena is not a pleasant place. And while Mrs. Nixon hated the cruelties of politics, she would never yield to a falsehood or a smear. In 1952, when some sought to force you off the national ticket, Mr. President, Pat spoke the words you desperately needed to hear, telling you to, quote, fight it through to the end. Her strength and spirit were called upon again during the most difficult days of your presidency, when she would encourage staff and friends by ending conversations with the words onward and upward. Half a century after you and the woman you lovingly called Miss Vagabond embarked on your life's journey, Mr. President, we can say with assurance and with pride that the world is a much better place because you were in the arena together. Mr. President, of all the challenges you have faced, enduring the pain and loss of your life's partner must be the most difficult. Our prayers and thoughts are with you, Julie and Tricia and members of the family. 
as you continue onward and upward, always, always fighting it through to the end, just as Pat Nixon would have wanted it. In John, the 14th chapter, we're told the words of Jesus. He speaks about going to another place where there are many mansions and where there are many rooms in those mansions. When we're confronted with the death of someone we love, we all pause for one moment in time to consider eternity. Jesus speaks to our grieving hearts words of comfort, like any child longs to hear when his parents are leaving home. What does a child say when you go away? The child says, where are you going? Can I go with you? Who's going to stay with me? In the upper room, Jesus called his disciples children and in death's presence, we're all children. Because death comes to us all, and we need the hope of which Jesus speaks in my Father's house are many mansions. In the hard days of the Depression, which President and Mrs. Nixon survived, when kinfolks came to see you in those days, you always wanted to say, come on, we have plenty of room. You're going to stay with us. Well, that's what Jesus says to the Apostle John here in our text, and to us when we sincerely turn to him. Since I know that death is there, I know your hearts will be in pain. But remember, I will turn that pain to joy, for when you come to my house, you have plenty of room, and I want you to stay with us. In my Father's house, there is much room. If it were not so, I would have told you. The scripture teaches that there's a time to be born, a time to live, and a time to die. Solomon said long ago that the day of a man's death is greater than the day of his birth. If this is true, this past Tuesday, June 22, Pat Nixon spent her greatest day. The passing of Pat Nixon occasions not only sorrow at her loss and sympathy for her family and friends, but it draws attention to all the great values of life that we've heard about this morning, so beautifully expressed. Some years ago, Mike Wallace of CBS told me 
that of all the people he met, he admired Pat Nixon the most. I read that once when they returned to the White House from Asia, President Eisenhower praised them publicly. He turned and he said, Dick, I've heard some pretty good reports on you. Then he turned to the second lady and smiled his widest grin. But the reports on you, Pat, have been wonderful. Time magazine once profiled her in a cover story and stated that her stamina and courage, her drive and control have made her into one of America's most remarkable women. Not just a show play piece, not merely a part of the best known team in contemporary politics, but a public figure in her own right. To quote one senator that we've already heard about, everybody liked Pat. I never heard in all the years that I traveled and the years that I knew them, I never heard one word of criticism of Pat Nixon. In your memoirs, Mr. President, I liked what you said, as has already been mentioned, that you told the Secret Service's code name for her would be Starlight, and that she fitted it to a T during the White House years. I was also impressed by her resourcefulness. I remember some years ago, Ruth and I were guests of the Nixon at their, Nixons at their apartment in, on Fifth Avenue, and we were invited by Jack Parr to go out to their home and watch the opening show of his new series. So we all piled into the car and went to the Parr's home and had a wonderful evening. The car brought us back to the Nixon's apartment, and we went to that apartment, and Ruth and I were staying at a nearby hotel. So President and Mrs. Nixon put us on the elevator, and for some strange reason that I've never learned, the elevator got stuck halfway between two floors. Ruth and I punched all the buttons. We hollered, kicked the sides of the elevator, pounded and yelled for help. And after about 20 minutes, Mr. and Mrs. Nixon showed up in their bathrobes and immediately took over. And Pat was the one who seemed to know exactly what to do. Finally, we got the elevator down only to find that the door to the apartment house was also locked. And the night watchman was off duty for some reason. And again, Pat helped us get out. We realized then that she not only knew how to handle herself in a crisis, but must have had experience in mechanics as well as hard works. Indeed, she was an amazing woman. One is reminded of the words of King Solomon. The memory of the just is blessed. Few women in public life have suffered as she has suffered and done so with such grace and dignity and love. In all the years I knew her, I never knew her to say anything unkind about anyone else, but I've never heard people say anything unkind about her. As we talked about Pat, my wife Ruth reminded me of a little poem by George Goodman, which she had written in the back of her Bible. Quote, he led me by the way of pain, a barren and starless place. I did not know his eyes were wet. He would not let me see his face. He left me like a frightened child, unshielded in a night of storm. How should I dream he was so near? The rain-swept darkness hid his form. But when the clouds were drifting back and dawn was breaking into day, I knew whose feet had walked with mine. I saw his footprints all the way. Pat Nixon, as we have heard, loved her husband and her family. I remember when she and I flew to Liberia on Air Force Two at the President's request to represent him and the United States at the inauguration of a new president in West Africa. During the long flight, Pat got to waxing eloquent on her love of Dick and what a great man he was. As if it were yesterday, I can still hear her saying, he's my man. The Nixon's longtime friend and housekeeper Hetty Retta, who is with us today, told the family a few hours after Pat's death that in her native country she was told not to express emotions. She told Pat's family, it was Mrs. Nixon who told me and taught me 
how to say, I love you. And to you, Mr. President, and the family today, I say, may God's grace be sufficient at this turning point in your lives. There's a democracy about death. John Doan said, it comes equally to us all and makes us all equal when it comes. The Bible says it is appointed unto people once to die. For the Christian believer who has been to the cross, death is no frightful leap into the dark, but is the entrance into a glorious new life. Pat Nixon's body lies in that casket, but Pat Nixon is not there. The real Pat Nixon has gone on to be with her Lord and her Savior. The apostle said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He was looking forward to death. For the believer, the brutal fact of death has been conquered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For the person who has turned from sin and has received Christ as Lord and Savior, death is not the end. For the believer, there's hope beyond the grave. There is a future life. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ not only died on the cross for our sins, but that he rose again. And there will be a day of resurrection. After the resurrection of Christ, the apostles never used the word death to express the close of a believer's life, but always referred to it in the image frame of being home with the Lord. I do not believe that God would have placed eternity in our hearts unless there was a future life. The Bible speaks of death in several ways. First, it's a coronation. The picture here is that of a great prince who after his struggles and conquests in an alien land comes to his native country to be crowned and honored for his deeds. We are as pilgrims and strangers in a foreign land. This world is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. Secondly, Death is spoken of as a cessation from labor. The scripture says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, that they may rest from their labors. The Lord of the harvest says to the weary laborers, you have been faithful in your task. Come and sit in the sheltered porch of my palace and rest from your labors. Enter now into the joy of your Lord. And I can assure Pat that that is far superior than the White House. Thirdly, death is spoken of as a departure. The Apostle Paul said, the time of my departure is at hand. I'm sure that there were times when the president and his wife parted as he went on another trip or she went on a trip. And separation always meant probably a tinge of sadness. But there was always high hope that they would meet again. It's no different now. She's gone on a trip and you and the family will see her again. Fourthly, death is a transition. Here we are pilgrims living in a frail, flimsy house subject to disease and pain and peril. But at death, we exchange this crumbling, disintegrating tent for a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Fifthly, death is spoken of as an exodus. We speak of decease as though it were the end of everything. But the word decease literally means exodus or going out. The imagery is that of the children of Israel, thousands of years ago leaving Egypt and its bondage, slavery and hardships. So death to the Christian is an exodus from the limitations, the perils and the bondage of this life. Pat Nixon's time to die came on Tuesday as someone has written, think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of taking hold of a hand and finding it God's hand, of breathing a new air and finding it celestial air, of feeling invigorated and finding it immortality, of passing from storm and tempest to an unknown calm, of waking up and finding it home. To you, Mr. President, Patricia, and Ed, Julie and David, and to you grandchildren, Chris, Jenny, Alex, Melanie, and other members of the family, 
May the God of all comfort sustain you now and the days to come. Tricia, you were quoted in the London Daily Mail last week. My mother's faith in God sustained her during the last difficult years of her life. Julie, in your wonderful book, Pat Nixon, The Untold Story, it has already been mentioned by Senator Dole, my mother had a phrase that she used countless times to end conversations with her White House staff members throughout the White House staff members throughout her father's presidency. Onward and upward, and I think that ought to be our thought today about Pat Nixon. Onward and upward. Onward and upward. What a marvelous phrase for all of us. So today, we say to all of you, on behalf of Pat, onward and upward. And God bless you all. <laughs>